Um, so here we are at the final lecture in the series. We are the survivors. <laughs> so what I want... Sorry? <laughs> That's right. Yes, I'll be issuing certificates at the end of this uh, lecture. <laughs> so um, in this lecture, I want to tell you about uh, some relatively recent work on uh, combinatorial optimization problems and relation to definability, which, uh, you know, building up a little bit on some of the things we've done. So um, I'll start with a quick review. So we've been talking about tools for analyzing the expressive power of logic over finite structures. And we used these in the last lecture to investigate logics for polynomial time, OK? Um, and so in particular, one thing we did last time was look at this notion of CK equivalence for fixed values of K, equivalence in the counting logic with K variables. And that was a, I mean, used that to show that um, solvability of systems of linear equations over the two element field is not definable in fixed point logic with counting. And, but still, fixed point logic with counting is a powerful and natural fragment of P, but it's not all of P. And in some sense, what, what, we're going to, what we're going to do in this lecture is say something more about both the uh, power and the limits of this in the context of combinatorial optimization problems. OK? So. Uh, in particular, FPC can't express the systems of, systems of linear equations over a finite field. And now, once we sort of knew this, we started to look at linear algebra. I said, linear algebra over finite fields is an interesting place to look at the limits of the expressive power of fixed point with counting. I'm not going to say much more about finite fields beyond this slide, but I just wanted to say, w when you start working on this, you can show that matrix multiplication over finite fields is definable. Now, what does this mean? If you have ordered structures, everything in polynomial time is definable in fixed point logic. So we really mean matrices that are unordered. And I'll make this precise uh, what that means uh, in a little bit. Uh, you can say you know, non-singularity inverse of a matrix. I think, Andreas, you had this in a paper, at least for the two element field, or maybe generally. Um, so there's a lot of linear algebra that you can already do in fixed point with counting. Uh, in this paper where we introduced rank logics, we also s showed that the, the reason we chose r the rank operator is because things like determinant, in fact, the characteristic polynomial of matrix are all definable in fixed point with counting. But still, you can't do solvability of systems of linear equations, and it follows that you can't define the rank of a matrix. 
Okay, so this seemed to focus on a particular property that you can't define, and that's what led us to define a logical fixed point with rank and look at the expressive power. But that's a direction I'm not going to pursue in this talk. Instead, I, want to, uh, I just wanted to stress that this is specifically about finite fields. If you go to the rational field, all of this is still definable, right? You can still do matrix multiplication, and I'll explain in the next slide or two what, uh, uh, what exactly this means. You can define you know, the invertible matrices. You can define the inverse of a matrix. You can define the characteristic polynomial, the determinant. But you can also define the rank of a matrix. And you can test systems of equations for solvability. All of this is in uh, Bjarke Holmes' PhD thesis from 2010, uh, which is, uh, yeah, I mean, sort of comprehensively covers this. But what I want to point out now is that this fact also follows from a result which uh, we proved uh, with Matt Anderson and uh, Bjarke Holm, which shows, uh, says that the optimization of linear programs with you know, rational coefficients can also be expressed in fixed point width counting. I put 2015 here. That's the, the journal paper appeared in December. Yes? When you say probability is undefinable, does that mean for a given polynomial, you can't say that it has a solution? What does it mean to say it's That's right. That, so, so, so there is, I mean, so the system of equation is presented as a finite structure, and there's no formula of the logic which is true in this structure if and only if it has a solution. OK. So, now, so I want to tell you a little bit about this uh, result to start with. So what, f first of all, let's, I mean, we're talking about finite structures. So let's turn everything into finite structures to start with. So what is a rational number? For a rational number for me, is given by a sign and two integers, numerator and, uh, uh, sorry, two uh, positive integers. I suppose, strictly speaking, n can be 0, but uh, d can't. OK. Um, and we're going to think of this as a finite structure as follows. We have a domain, b, which is linearly ordered. And we have three unary relations on b which represent the sign, the numerator, and the denominator. Okay, So let's think of this as a binary representation of a rational number. So the sign we'll just take is, if it's empty, it's 1. If it's non-empty, it's minus 1. And these just code the binary representation of these numbers, seeing this as an ordered collection of bits, bit positions. Okay, So this is just a, it's a linearly ordered finite structure. right? That's what a rational number is for us. And since it's ordered, we know that anything, any polynomial time operation on these is going to be definable in fixed point logic. So we can assume that we have operations in FPC for doing all of ordinary arithmetic on rational numbers. OK? I don't understand. The structure is one rational number. Yes. What does it mean? Well, I mean, so, so I'm saying I'm adopting this as a representation. Now you can, I, I'll, I'll leave it to you. You can easily define a representation of two rational numbers in one structure and a formula that, that defines their sum, you know, or, or the product, R right? Yeah, OK, but, but then, so what, what does it mean to be definable? There is a formula such that. OK, my, 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 maybe. I mean, strictly speaking, uh, OK. So given a structure which is a pair of rational numbers, that's a, stru a structure like that will basically have s1, s2, n1, n2, d1, and d2, right? Yeah. That's a pair of rational numbers. And I, I'll just say we can define um, let me call this pi for product, let's say, <coughs> pi s, pi n, pi d, a triple of formulas of fixed point with counting, which interpreted in any such structure will give you the sign, the numerator, and the denominator of the product. OK? Assuming b has enough bits to represent the product. OK? And there's a fixed triple of such formulas, a fixed interpretation of uh, uh, which will define product and sum. And any reasonable operation you want. OK. 
Now I'm going to talk about vectors and matrices of rational numbers. And crucially, while I think the, the rational number is represented by an ordered structure, the order is in, inevitable there, a vector is not necessarily an ordered structure. So a vector indexed by a set i, right, we represent as a structure whose domain <coughs> is a domain of bit positions, as we had before, and a separate domain representing the index set i. And the i can be an unordered set. So we have an order on the bit positions. And now the sign, numerator, and denominator are binary relations which relate the index to these bit positions. So fix an index value in i, and these give you the sets in b representing the sign, the numerator, and denominator of the ith vector. OK? And similarly, a rational matrix, now you can take the next step, will have as domain the two, in, uh, the two index sets in B and S and, and D, which are ternary relations, which relate to uh, positions I and J, and give you the rational entry in position IJ. OK? So sorry, are you viewing these as uh, multi-sorted structures where I and J are yeah. distinguished? That's right. So, so, so I, I'm assuming you, you can, if you want, have a single uh, universe and unary relations i, j, and b. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm assuming in the logic I can tell w whether something is an i or a j or a b, right? But not ordering within i or j. Exactly. That's the important thing. I mean, if i and j were ordered sets, then again, everything that's polynomial time becomes definable. But th th this is, now you might say, why are we restricting ourselves to unordered matrices? But there is a good reason for this, which uh, uh, Hopefully, I'll, will become clear, and I'll try and stress it when we get to that point. OK. So as an example, actually, yeah, we'll, I think we are at a point. <laughs> weighted graphs are the, are, are, are the sort of object you might want to say something about. And weighted graphs are very naturally, are, I, I mean, naturally arise in optimization problems. You have a graph, and the, the edges carry weights, which are, say, rational, integer weights or rational weights or some, something like this. And like with everything we've done so far, we don't want to assume an order on the vertices of the graph or, uh, or on the edges of the graph or anything like that. So what is a weighted graph? We'll think of it. Uh, so a vertex set with rational weights is simply, um, so what have I said here? Non-negative rational weights on the edges. So right, we, we, uh, this is. A universe of vertices, and again, bit positions. And we have weight relations which associate with every pair of vertices the numerator and denominator as a subset of the bit positions. OK, this is, just a, this is simply exactly this situation where i happens to be the set v cross v on a, on a, uh, on a graph, on a given graph, on a, ver a given vertex set v. OK. Sorry, I'm a little bit confused. Yeah. One, one weight was represented by a structure, but now you have a weighted graph. Yes. So, so, so the point was, what, so, yes, uh, uh, I'm sorry I'm not being very clear then. So a, a single rational number is represented by unary relations on, this, uh, on the set of bit positions, which is a linearly ordered set. Now, a vector of, or, or a weighted graph we want to associate a set, a unary relation for numerator, with every pair of vertices. Right? And so we have a ternary relation, which we basically think of this with every pair of vertices, it associates a subset of B. That gives the numerator associated with that pair. And another ternary relation, which every, for every pair of vertices, gives us a set of elements of B, which gives us the denominator associated with that pair. Right? So. Um, yeah, I was just trying to go through this step by step. So, so I think now it's sort of clear how we represent rational matrices as finite structures. And we can now sensibly ask questions about definability. And the particular definability questions we want to ask have to do with, say, linear programming. Because I, I mean, I sort of said at the beginning that we show that optimization of linear programs is definable in fixed point with counting. Linear programming is, of course, an important algorithmic tool, and it's uh, solved for a large variety of optimization problems. And I'm going to go on to look at uh, a few. We know it is polynomial time solvable by 
result uh, going back to Kachian um, in 1980. So let's just define the setup. So a linear program for, for us is given by a set of constraints over a set of variables. And crucially, in the kinds of applications we're interested in, these variables and these constraints don't come with any order on them. Right? They're unordered sets. Each constraint is a vector of rationals indexed by the variables and an, an additional rational. So basically, we think of this as, I think I have it here, yes. Right? Basically, uh, that linear con constraint, a, AC transpose times x is less than or equal to BC for every constraint C. So given such a constraint, there's a simple decision problem. Is it solvable? Is it feasible? And that's just saying that is there a vector of rationals which satisfies all of them simultaneously? The optimization problem in general has this along with an objective function, which is given by another vector. Right? It's a linear objective function. And we want to find the maximum value, let's say, of the objective function over the set of uh, uh, the set of rationals witnessing the feasibility. And what we show, I know I realize this has changed. 2013 was the conference paper. <laughs> but uh, uh, what we show is that this problem, the feasibility problem, and the corresponding optimization problem are expressible in fixed point with counting. OK, so we can define a fixed point with counting formula, which well, a sentence which will decide feasibility. Right? Given the set of constraints, it'll determine whether it's, uh, uh, I mean, it'll be satisfied in there if and only if that set of constraint is feasible. And it expresses optimization in this sense, in that there, is a, there will be a tuple of formulas which interpreted in a linear program will give you the optimum value. OK? Assuming there is one, yeah. So I mean, we, 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 we have to define it carefully. Essentially, there is an interpretation which, I mean, you find a, 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 some code, you know, put this to be minus 1 or something, which says that uh, it's uh, infeasible. Or feasible but unbounded. Feasible but unbounded, exactly. So we, so we distinguish the cases, and we show the, construct the formula, which you know, gives you all possible values. Yeah. I'm puzzled, because before you said that solvability of linear equations is not expressed. Over finite fields. That's, that, that was a okay. distinction I was making at the beginning. We proved that over finite fields it's not. But already in Bjarke's thesis, he showed that over the rational field it was. And this is in some sense a generalization because it shows that you know, optimization of linear programs is all already definable. So this is a stronger definability result than feasibility of linear equations. But the key distinction is this works over the rational field. It does not work over finite fields. So the st classic algorithm for both is the same, but for e equations, I mean, is well, 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 that's right. So, so the, the, I mean, Gaussian elimination algorithm, we don't know how to implement. We are going to Im implement the ellipsoid method, right? OK, so that's uh, the, which, which turns out is, is something we can do in here. And that doesn't work over finite fields. I mean. And what does Bjarke do? It, it requires, hmm? For systems of equations over the rationals, Bjarke, how does he do it? He actually shows how to define the rank of the matrix. And this depends upon a characterization of rank, which really works only on fields of characteristic 0. So uh, it's, that, 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 that was a different uh, line. OK. So I mean, he also shows that the Gaussian elimination doesn't work, right? Sorry? Uh, shows that Gaussian The Gaussian elimination doesn't work, exactly, right? Okay. I'm sorry, I'm a little bit confused here. You try to express the decision problem. Let's, let's look at the decision problem deciding this inequality, right? Yes. Because that's, that's really in some sense. Sure. If you can express this by itself in FPC, automatically because of the polynomial time, uh, because FPC is contained in, in P time, right? Mm -hmm. It gives you polynomial time. That's right. So, you, so what, what does it mean to say you, you did the ellipsoid algorithm? Oh, well, oh, OK, but the question is, yes, how do we construct this FPC formula, right? But to show it's definable, we need to construct this FPC formula. We encode the ellipsoid algorithm, right? I mean, so, so our formula is an encoding of the algorithm, or uh, adapted. Yes, Sam? I guess the point is just because Cauchy in this polynomial time doesn't automatically make it FPC. That's right. No. 
Uh, now, uh, I, I think Fokion was asking whether we had found another polynomial time algorithm, a different polynomial time algorithm. We, we encode the ellipsoid method. Right. The point is the Gaussian doesn't work because you don't have an order. You don't have an order. That's right. Exactly. Okay. So, but, uh, one last thing I just wanted to understand. So with Kachin's algorithm, it's an iterative algorithm that appro effectively approximates to arbitrary desired precision. Yeah. And then you need to do a kind of a rounding. Could yeah. you also do the rounding inside FPC? Well, what you can do is the following. Maybe if I should go on, because I, I mean, I, I, I think you're just preempting the, 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 the sort of, I mean, I don't know that I have the exact answer on my slides, but I think the question will make sense once I start talking about the ellipsoid method, okay? Right, so what is the ellipsoid method? Moving on. Um, we have a set of linear constraints. They determine a polytope. Um, I mean, this is in two dimensions because that's all that was av available to me on the slide. But this is, so this would be one with, let's say, five linear constraints, and it, it, it determines a bounded polytope. So the ellipsoid method sort of works by we want to find a point inside this uh, polytope. We start somewhere, may as well start at the origin. And from the, because all of these are given by rational coefficients, from the ra rationals, looking at the largest size of the denominator, you can, you can calculate a bound on an ellipsoid centered at the origin, which must contain the, this polytope, all right? Or, well, if it's bounded or... So we start, start at the origin and calculate the ellipsoid. Now, we can test whether this origin is in the polytope. If it is, of course, we're done. Since it's not, we choose one of the linear constraints that it violates, right? So it's on the wrong side of this line. You calculate a new point by projecting or, you know, sort of moving orthogonally to the hyperplane, which, uh, 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 which you picked. And f around this, you can calculate a new ellipsoid, which still contains the polytope, but is substantially smaller in volume. And this substantially smaller is what guarantees convergence, because it says that in at most po polynomially many steps, now this is polynomial not in the number of constraints, but in the bit precision of these, uh, of these constraints, you're guaranteed that if you still are not in the polytope, your ellipsoid will have shrunk so small that you will know that the polytope is empty. Okay? And that's the, that, that's the sort of approximation and rounding you're talking about. And so here, it's crucial that this thing works in polynomial time, not just in, in the number of constraints or anything, but in the size of this B, which we made explicitly a part of the structure. Okay. So, uh, so in, in some sense, you don't have to do that rounding explicitly. Okay. But um, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if I've answered this question. What you need to do is at the very beginning, you need to make uh, the, so the, the initial polytope needs to be full dimensional. Yes. Uh, very, 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 very good point. And we'll have to address this. Yes. Okay. The, po the, the, the point Kushia is making is because this, um, this thing about half the volume, if the polytope is not full dimensional, for instance, it's a, it's a two dimensional polytope inside a three dimensional space, it has zero volume to start with, right? And so this, this thing doesn't work. But yeah, we'll, uh, we needed to overcome that and I'll say something about that. Okay, but at the moment, I've just described sort of the rough outline of the ellipsoid method. All the calculations you need to do, you can implement in FPC, you know, because all of this sort of matrix manipulation that I talked about, uh, you know, algebraic manipulations of unordered matrices, this is the sort of stuff I, I said on the first slide, we all know how to do. The one thing we don't know how to do is going back over here, I said, when this is not in there, you choose one of the constraints that it violates, but choosing is what we can't do, right? The set of constraints is an unordered set, and you can't pick one. In, out, of, out of it in, uh, in the logic. Okay, But the great thing about the ellipsoid method is it's ro robust enough that each, each step, it, you don't actually have to pick one of the constraints. All you need is some hyperplane that separates the polytope from your current point. 
So for instance, right? I mean, it doesn't have to be one of the constraints. It could be this. And in particular, just take the set of all the constraints that are violated and add them up. By linearity, this is also a separating hyperplane. Right? So no choice involved. You just add them up, and it works. OK? But will that reduce the volume sufficiently? Yes. Yeah, no, the, 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 that is, I mean, I mean, the ellipsoid method is very robust as far as this, this sort of thing is concerned. Almost anything will, right? This could, this could have been another constraint anyway without affecting the power drop. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, um, okay. So, so, but as I said, now the ellipsoid method is, is very robust and it can do much more than this. In that, Actually, in many applications, the ellipsoid method, you aren't even given this constraint ma matrix explicitly. It's somehow implicitly given uh, by some kind of structure. All you really require is that from this structure, and given a candidate point, you can d determine in polynomial time a hyperplane that separates your point from the polytope. Right? You don't explicitly have a description of the polytope in terms of a set of constraints. Right? All you need to do is to be able to calculate a separating hyperplane given any point. Right, that's what we call a separation oracle. In particular, the, the representation may be compact in that the number of facets of this polytope could be exponentially large. So exp writing it out explicitly would be exponential size in the size of the structure you actually have. Okay? And what we show is that as long as the separation oracle is definable in FPC, then the optimization problem can be solved in FPC. So this whole thing works if the separation oracle is given by some FPC formula. So what is it? formally, what do we mean? So a representation of a class of polytopes is some relational vocabulary, and a mapping which takes tau structures to the polytopes in P, which is isomorphism invariant. OK? So we don't care at the one. We are putting no con other conditions on this. So it's just some way of representing polytopes as structures in an isomorphism invariant fashion. And then a separation oracle. We say a separation oracle for this representation is definable if there is an FPC formula. And again, I think maybe with a nod to Janos, I really should say an FPC interpretation. It's generally a tuple of formulas, which given a structure right, and a vector. Now, this vector, uh, this tuple of variables, we assume that's uh, this tuple of variables is, is, is given in the structure, determines either that this is in the polytope or it defines, in this sense, a hyperplane that separates the polytope from, uh, from this V. Okay? So this FPC formula acts on a structure which encodes the polytope in some compact fashion, possibly, and a structure which represents a vector. And as an interpretation, defines a hyperplane, right? Or gives you the answer. It's solved. Okay. Now, um, I'm going to say this a, a bit quickly, and this is partly, you know, addressing your your issue of uh, of polytopes of zero volume. The way, this wor the, the, the way this whole thing works is the structure A, we assume, OK, the variables are represented explicitly as a set in the structure, let's say. But the number of facets of this polytope may be exponential and may not be represented explicitly. The variables form an unordered set. But we can construct a sort of partial order on them using the separation oracle. So initially, you start with all the variables are kind of uh, not distinguished from each other. You start with the or point at the origin. And you, if you get a separating hyperplane from the polytope, essentially, this hyperplane will distinguish some variables from others. It distinguish some dimensions from others in the, in the, in the space. And that constructs uh, sort of a partial, it, it, it makes a certain distinction between some of the dimensions. At any point, we, can, we have a projection which defines, okay, 
I, I, I should have put more on the slide. But so at any point, we have the set of variables, and we have an equivalence relation on the variables, meaning those are variables which we haven't been able to distinguish yet. And this, it's actually an ordered equivalence relation. So we have an ordering on the equivalence classes. This defines a projection onto a space of smaller dimension, which is basically the quotient of this, the quotient of the set of dimensions under this equivalence relation. Okay, and we we can define a way of projecting the polytope from this larger dimension space to the smaller dimension space in a way that preserves feasibility. Or, if it fails, in the sense that it might happen that it doesn't preserve feasibility, but if it does, then the separation oracle will pop out and refine this equivalence relation further. Okay. This is a bit hand wavy, I know, but uh, I think it's uh, uh, I'll, I'll I'll have to refer you to, well, we can discuss this further for details if you want. OK. And this kind of gets around this uh, lack of full dimension, because we, are, we end up working in a space which is quotiented, and so is of smaller dimension. And we keep increasing the dimension until we hit the dimension of the polytope, effectively. Or, or I mean, we don't actually have to, because if the, if the polytope has, has automorphisms, we might actually work in a smaller dimensional space. Right, but it, it kind of makes it work. OK. So now the application I want to show you is graph matching. Right. So remember that in a graph, a matching is a set of edges, which is uh, so that every vertex is incident to at most one edge uh, in M. And we saw that we can't define the existence of a perfect matching in fixed point logic in the absence of counting. Right? That was a simple example with bipartite graphs. Actually, for bipartite graphs, we've known for a while that it is definable in fixed point with counting. This is in a, in a paper by uh, Andreas with Yuri and Sahar and Shela. I mean, this is all, you know, quite a, this was a, quite a clever construction, uh, basically showing that if you refine the bipartite graph by k equivalence for suitably suitable large k. I think 3 is probably enough. I see k equivalence. And then you throw in all the edges between equivalent uh, uh, bet between equivalence classes. You don't create a matching if there wasn't one already. And then, the, and, and then it becomes, you know, you can check in this graph. OK. Um, but that was for bipartite graphs. And for general graphs, it was open since then. And we're able to do this now by basically showing that effectively the optimization problem of finding the maximum matching in a weighted graph coded suitably as a linear program, for, uh, we, we, we get something for which the separation oracle is definable in fixed point with counting. OK. So, so, sorry, the result is the existence of a, a not definable in FP or in FPC available? So this is, sorry, this is not definable in FP. FP. Yeah, we, this, this we showed, right? We, we, we saw this as an example. Yeah. And in FPC, we're, I'm going to prove it is definable by showing that uh, essentially, if you code it up suitably as a linear program, we can express the separation oracle for it in FPC. OK? Uh, well, we, yeah, the, the, the Edmonds polytope is what we use, yes. Yes. So this is the Edmonds polytope. So the problem is we're given a graph along with the weight, weights on the edges, right? A positive uh, or non-negative rational weights. Then the problem of finding a maximum weight matching is given by this polytope. Now note this polytope is of exponential, has exponentially many facets. So we don't want to write this out explicitly. OK, so what is it? So why is the set of variables in this uh, linear program? And we are going to say maximize the weights of these subject to certain constraints. So uh, this just says you're only picking edges, right? This is the adjacency matrix of the graph, I suppose. Yes. Uh, you're assigning a, you're picking each edge with uh, zero or more weight, I suppose, strictly speaking, you, you know, at most once as well. And this is the key point. I mean, and, and I'm not going to prove it to you, but, but this is what Edmund shows. 
that if you throw in this exponential set of constraints, which basically says for every odd set of vertices, you say that the set of edges you pick uh, from among the set w has weight at most half of w minus 1, then, the, you know, then this actually defines the, what should I say, the convex hull of the perfect, of the maximum weight matching. Sorry, the convex hull of the matchings. And so maximizing over this gives you the maximum weight matching. OK, so this is, as I said, this is an, this is an exponential size linear program. You don't want to write it out explicitly. It's exponential in the size of the graph that we start with. But what we can show is that there is a FPC interpretation which, given just the weighted graph and a candidate vector, right, so assignment of weights to the edges, will give you a separation, a separating hyperplane if it's not a matching or tell you it is a matching, etc. Right. So this this gives us the separation oracle we need. And as a consequence, there's an FPC formula that can define the size of the maximum matching in a graph. Note, you can't write down a formula that defines an actual matching, because this is not invariant under isomorphisms. Right? A clique, for instance, contains exponentially ma many matchings, all isomorphic to each other. There's no way you can pick out one. There's no way you can even define them all. Right? But all, what you can do is get the value. How big is the matching? Okay, that pops out of this. Um, I mean, it's kind of, in a sense, the FPC formula will give you a solution to the uh, uh, to the system of linear equations, but that's the solution will be not a matching but a linear combination of matchings. Right. Well, with linear programming, you are getting the solution. Sorry. Before right, but, 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 but this is the thing. So unlike, uh, I mean, the solution we get is not necessarily a vertex of the polytope, right? You may live on the face of the polytope. That's right. It, it can be somewhere on the face of the polytope. Yeah. And so in, in this case, it's not going to be a matching in general. It'll be some linear combination of maximum matchings. Because, because up to isomorphism, we can't distinguish them. So in some sense, we'll get a, a linear combination of all of them. Well, yeah. Of. So I see. So this, in linear programming, there's the standard trick that if you get an optimal solution, you can convert it to an optimal basic feasible solution by going to the nearby basis. So that part is. That part you can't do in fixed point with counting because that breaks uh, isomorphisms, yes. OK. So. Now, uh, if I have 20 minutes remaining, I want to give you a sort of more recent uh, application of this to, uh, to constraint satisfaction problems we've been thinking about. So to introduce this, I'm going to introduce what, what I, I've just given it a name, counting width. Uh, say we have a class of structures, a class of finite structures. Which may, and with any class of finite structures, any what I call a property at the beginning of the course, we associate a function, I'll call it the counting width, from numbers to numbers, which is for every n gives you the least k, so that some formula theta of ck defines exactly the structures in this class with at most n elements, right? So note, take any class of structures, if I bound the size of structures to n, I can define the structures in this class with a first order formula. Right, because they're only f up to isomorphism finitely many. I bound it n. In fact, I can do it with a form, first order formula using no more than n variables. Okay. So I want to say, well, let's count the number of variables we need. But rather than first order logic, I'm going to allow counting. So I'm looking at the number of variables you need in counting logic to define it, to define the structures of size at most n in the class C. Okay, I'm, I'm treating this as a sort of measure of, of the complexity of the class. It's, it's always less at most n. As I said, you can always write down a formula of at most n variables, right? Well, it's always at most n if the class is definable in fixed point with counting. It's in fact a constant. That was what we said last time that any formula of fixed point with counting is invariable. Sorry, is invariant under k equivalence for some fixed value of k. 
And then from that, you can see that from, for a fixed bounded size structure, it translates into a formula of CK. OK, so for classes definable in FPC, this is bounded by a constant. The thing that I showed you last time, I used these toroidal grids to show you that solving systems of linear equations over the two element field is uh, uh, not definable. It actually immediately gives you a bound, lower bound of square root of n on the size of the, on, on this function because basically I constructed a structure of size order k squared where you know solvability is not doable with in CK. Right? It was k squared. It turns out you can improve this lower bound from square root of n to omega n by instead of these explicit toroidal grids, you consider expander graphs or something like this. I, I, I'm, I'm not going into that. Just I want, I want to say that the, the, the lower bound can be improved to linear. Right? So it's pretty much as bad as it gets because this function is always bounded by n up above. OK. What does this have to do with constraint satisfaction problems? Uh, Fokion has kind of uh, introduced constraint satisfaction problems in his, uh, uh, in his lectures. Usually, you describe a constraint language as given by some finite domain D and a collection of relations on D, which is what, what we just call a finite relational structure, when the language is finite. And so I'm going to restrict ourselves to finite languages for now. right? So this is just a finite relational structure the way we've been thinking about it. And this problem, this CSP gamma, is the problem of deciding, given a set of constraints, whether it is satisfiable. And what is a constraint? A constraint is a tuple of variables along with a relation R from gamma. right? And so we're, to, to satisfy it is to find an assignment of values to this in the domain D so that this tuple of values is in the relation R. right? So a that's what a constraint is. A set of constraints can therefore be seen simply as another finite relational structure. You take the, the, the set of all variables that appear. You take the relations that are, appear on them. And then the problem is simply that of homomorphism. Decide whether there's a homomorphism from this instant to this fixed finite relational structure. Right? So this, as Fokion said, CSP is just the homomorphism problem for finite structures. Okay. Now, there's been a lot of work on classifying CSPs. Fokion mentioned that non-two-colorability non is definable. So two-colorability, which can be expressed as a constraint satisfaction problem, right? The domain is just the two colors. And the relation you have is that of this equality, right? So two, two colors are related if they're not the same. And a homomorphism from a graph to that is a two-coloring of the graph. In general, things definable in data log are closed under homomorphisms. So it, it's, it makes sense to talk of the complement of, so for any constraint language, CSP gamma, its complement is closed under homomorphisms. So it makes sense to ask whether its complement is definable in data log. I will usually abbreviate this to saying CSP gamma is in data log, but I always understand that means that its complement is definable in data log. Okay. The data log definable ones are said to have bounded width. I'm not going to define, I mean, what bounded width is. Treat this as the definition. It's usually, it's the same as saying that this constraint satisfaction problem is solved by certain local consistency algorithms, right? These are things which construct assignments to the variables, checking consistency for k variables at a time, and propagating these, uh, these constraints, okay? So they, 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 they really show, they're, they're really checking that this set of constraints is locally satisfiable. Now, if a constraint satisfaction problem has bounded width, it's definable in fixed point width counting because fixed point width counting is, subsumes data log. And so this measure that I defined, what I call the counting width, is bounded. OK? So it kind of justifies the name bounded width, or that's kind of why I call this counting width as well. In the other direction, we can show that if this thing is not d in data log, then this function is unbounded. So actually, the only, CS, the only constraint satisfaction problems definable in fixed point with counting are already definable in data log. This follows from uh, results in these two papers, though you won't find this stated as such uh, 
in, uh, in, in, in either of them. Um, basically, the Bartow and Kozik papers established a certain su sufficient algebraic conditions for this to have bounded width. Again, I'm not going to formulate those. And what we showed was that in the absence of these conditions, solvability of systems of linear equations over a finite field or finite abelian group generally can be reduced to this by means of definable reductions. And therefore, the undefinability carries over. Undefinability in this carries over to that. What I want to point out now, and this is, a, uh, sort of have to thank Albert for this, that extracting from a paper by Matt Valerio. Valerio, sorry, I misspelled that. Uh, actually, these definable reductions can all be made linear, so they don't blow up the size of the structure more than linearly. And so the lower bound on uh, the counting width of this we establish carries over linearly to all of these. So CSP gamma has. Um, and if CSP is not a bounded width, so if it is a bounded width, this thing is a constant. If it's not a bounded width, there's a linear lower bound on it. Okay. So I just want to co compare this with, I mean, Fokion mentioned a few times the Fermat-Vardy dichotomy conjecture, which says that for every constraint language, either uh, CSP gamma is NP or CSP gamma is NP complete. Right? We don't know this still. We have a definability dichotomy from what I said on the previous slide, for every gamma, either this counting width is constant, and then CSP gamma is definable in data log, or this thing is bounded below by a linear function, and it's not definable even in FPC. OK? Note all problems in here, in number one, are in P. Every data log definable one is in P. But there are problems in P in, in the second class as well, like solvability of systems of linear equations. Right? They fall into this class. So this is not the Federvardi dichotomy. Right? We have everything here is in P. Everything that we know to be NP hard falls in this class, but some polynomial time problems also do. Okay? But this picture becomes much cleaner when we look at optimization problems rather than just um, decidability problems of CSPs. So I'll write max CSP gamma for the problem, which is the problem of determining, given an instance of CSP gamma, what is the maximum number of constraints that can be simultaneously satisfied? Right? It's, it's, it's now an optimization problem. And here, Johan Topper and Standa Zivny have shown a nice dichotomy. If CSP gamma is a bounded width, then max CSP is is solvable in polynomial time by its basic linear programming relaxation. I'll define this in a moment. And if it's not a bounded width, then the problem, the maximization problem is NP hard. Right? So the decision problem might be polynomial time, but the optimization problem is NP hard. So th this is a real dichotomy. And the key, the key example to keep in mind is max XOR sat. Given a set of uh, XOR sat uh, clauses, right? So uh, variables connected by the XOR operator. Determining its feasibility is simply solving a system of linear equations over the two element field. That is uh, decidable. But maximizing the number of constraints that you can simultaneously satisfy is an NP hard problem. And this turns out it's essentially true for all of, the, for, for all of these, all the constraints of polynomial time which were falling in the, this unbounded class, the corresponding maximization problem is NP hard. OK? Sort of really nice dichotomy theorem. So now what, 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 what can we say about this? I said the ones of bounded width, the maximization problem, is solved by its basic linear programming relaxation. Uh, what that means is if you have an instance of this, you can turn it into a linear program. So what do we have? The instance consists of a set of variables v. Gamma has a domain d. And we have a set of constraints in the instance of the form, you know, tuple of variables and a relation r. And this is the linear program. I've, uh, this is a cut and paste job. So I'm uh, written by Peng Ming over there. So I'm relying on uh, you for. Uh, checking any errors in here, but okay. 
This is a linear program. Um, the variables in the linear program, I, I want to distinguish from the, the variables of the constraint satisfaction problem is a different thing from the variables of the linear program. The variables in the linear program are the lambdas and mu's in this. Okay? There is one variable mu for each pair, v, where v is a variable from that, and a, where a is an element of the domain. And think of this as saying, we want, these, we want this to take the value 1 if the variable v is assigned to the element a and 0 otherwise. Okay. All we're saying here is, if you sum over all values on the domain of mu v a, it's 1. Okay. So the, the, the variable little v gets assigned to something in the domain, and the sum of the, the, these things is 1. The variable lambda cd, I think of as saying, that the constraint C is satisfied. Um, well, the constraint C is assigned to the tuple D from the domain. So now this condition is basically f f enforcing the consistency between those two, two, two sets of variables by, by saying that this thing really takes the value you get by assigning the, uh, the variables that appear inside this tuple C, sorry, inside this tuple X, to the elements given by A. And this is the maximization condition, which says you maximize the number of constraints satisfied. OK. Uh, we probably haven't got all that. But this, we, 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 we get a linear program from an instance of CSP. And the fact is, you need to add non-negativity to this. You need to add non, uh, yes, all sorry. The all, the, all the variables are non-negative. Yeah, I should have, OK. Now, any 0, 1 solution to this okay, is a, so, you know, well, maximizing this, the maximal 0, 1 solution to this is exactly the max CSP of gamma. Okay. But of course, what we get when we solve a linear program is not an integer solution in general. Uh, Okay, I, I, I'm looking at the next slide. It seems to be further ahead than I wanted. So, a zero one solution would, be, would give us what we, what we want. In general, we get a non integer solution. Okay? And that's the, a that's the sort of relaxation of the problem we wanted to solve. And I maybe should go back and say, right, what this shows is that if the original CSP is of bounded width, which is the same thing as saying it's definable in data log, then this basic linear programming relaxation will actually give you the solution to the optimization problem. Okay. If it's not of bounded width, it won't. Right? The problem is NP-hard. You're not going to solve it just by translating it into a linear program. So what do you do in the case where, in the general case, where, 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 this, uh, where the original problem is NP-hard? What people do is they consider uh, tightenings of this okay, through lift and project hierarchies. So the idea is we have a polytope for an inter for op in integer optimization problem. We're really interested in the, the thing which is the convex hull of the integer solutions. That's what we really want to get our hands on. What the linear program defines is some larger polytope. And so lift and project uh, things we, we get by adding Additional constraints, typically the idea is for tuples of variables in the original program, you add new variables intended to represent the product, and you add linear constraints or semi-definite constraints to try and enforce this meaning. Okay? I mean, you can't write down products because you want to keep it all linear, but this is the, this is the general idea. So you go to a space of higher dimension with these additional variables. And the, idea, the hope is that projecting it down, you get a polytope which is smaller than the linear programming relaxation, but still contains the convex hull of the integer solutions you're interested in. As you increase the value of t, you get hierarchies of uh, you know, tighter constraints. And people have looked at various ones. I'll just mention these by name. I'm not going to define them. Sher Ali Adams, Lova Schreiber, Lasser hierarchy, right? For uh, in increasing values of t. The last is, in some sense, the strongest in that this tth level of the Lasser hierarchy on a polytope K is included in, those, uh, in the corresponding levels of the others. So it's give, giving you the tightest um, approximation. 
OK, so the Lasser hierarchy is a um, hierarchy of semi-definite programs. I'm not going to write down the definition. I had the, I, last night I was sitting with the slides and I call, you know putting down this and I thought it was just be a bit too much. So I'll, uh, I'll, I'll leave that out. Let me just state the following facts about it. So we have a polytope. Okay. We are interested in the integer points in this polytope. So I'm, here K star denotes the convex hull of the integer points. This is always contained in the projection you get from the tth level, projection back down to the original variables from the, of the tth level of the Lasser hierarchy. As you go up the hierarchy, right, it gets you're, you're getting smaller uh, convex sets, and if you go up to the level n, where n is the the number of variables you started with, then uh, then you actually get projecting down. You do get the convex hull of the integer points. So, so that's the, you know, the the ultimate solution. Okay. With this, I can now just state this results. This is in a, a forthcoming paper with Pengming over there. So for each constraint language gamma and each fixed value of t, we can define an FPC interpretation that takes an instance of CSP to the tth level of the Lasser hierarchy over BLP. But what do I mean by takes it to this? Basically, in the instance, you define, you can define an explicit representation of the semi-definite program, which is the tth level of the Lasser hierarchy over, uh, over the basic linear programming relaxation of this instance. So, so there is an interpretation that will do this for you. The FPC implementation of the ellipsoid method I described we show we can extend it to semi-definite programs. So you know, it, it, it works for not just for solving the, the linear programs. There are some technical conditions. We have to worry about the full dimensionality. But this can be made to work. And the conclusion is that if the tth level of the Lasser hierarchy actually solves this, by solves this, I mean project it down. It gives you the, in, the convex hull of the integer solutions. Then t is bounded below by a linear function of the, the counting width of CSP gamma. This is simply because you compose with these FPC interpretations, and they blow up the number of variables you need at, by at most constant factors. And so if the tth level solves it, you can take this formula that solves the semi-definite programs, compose it with the interpretation, and get an FPC formula that solves the maximization problem, or, or solves the decision problem on the original CSP gamma. And this is the lower bound on the number of variables you need there. Compose, multiply by the two constants in the interpretations, you get this. But now this function we've shown exhibits this dichotomy. So the conclusion is, if CSP gamma is not a bounded width, <coughs> then the number of Lasser, levels of the Lasser hierarchy you need is bounded below by a linear function. So you can't do better. So for any CSP gamma, either the basic linear programming so, uh, you know, method solves it, and you, you know, you're in the bounded width case, or you need a linear number of levels to get to the uh, convex hull of the integer uh, solutions. OK, this is the point where I wanted to end. Uh, as I said, this is sort of recent work will be good there. This theorem up there, uh, presumably this interpretation can be made uniform in gamma and t. Can it? In, well, you, uniform in gamma and t. You, you, well, certainly you, uniform in t. I mean, as ga what would it mean to be uniform? Uh, yeah, I suppose. Uh, yeah, yes. So there's certainly there's an algorithm which, given gamma and t, will give you the interpretation. And is it, the dependence in t is not exponential. It's linear, probably. So in the number of or how is it? It's even better, probably. So, I mean, no, it depends. It's empty hard. No, no, the, 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 the okay. interpretation is only a fixed number of variables. The way it is stated is a fixed number of variables for each fixed t. Right. If you make it uniform in t. Right. 
sorry, the, you're, now you're talking about the number of variables that appear in the interpretation, in the FPC formula defining the interpretation. Uh, it is linear in T, I guess. No, I mean, there, well, well, what do you mean by uniform? Uh, there is certainly an algorithm which, given gamma and t, will give you the interpretation. The number of variables that appear in the interpretation is going to be linear in t. Okay, so the answer is it's not as uniform as I wanted. Okay. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Janusz. I want to go back to the previous topic. Uh huh. I would have modeled uh, computing over the rational matrices in some version of finite, meta finite model theory rather than the way you you put it. Can you push some of the result over to the framework? Right. Um, okay. I mean, I, I'm I haven't tried to do that. So anything I say, I'm just saying all off the top of my head, uh, so treat with caution. I mean, I think writing down this FPC formula that solves it in that context would not be uh, difficult. I mean, th one of the reasons for doing it this way is because it makes explicit the dependence on the size of B, which is very important in the ellipsoid method, right? I mean, in, in general, for linear programming, we don't know any strongly polynomial algorithms, right? We don't know any algorithms where taking arithmetic operations as unit cost uh, are polynomial time in the size of the number of variables. And because you have to take polynomial time in the size of this. And therefore, making this explicit, I think, is a more honest representation of that situation than just hiding this in an infinite structure. But that's, as I said, I'm just, uh, I haven't really thought about that. Okay. I have a comment and two questions, if I may. Mm -hmm. uh, the comment first, there is a very old result, a very cute result by Nimrod Megiddo, that uh, linear programming, mm -hmm. that in the, for the decision problem for inequalities, yeah. is complete for polynomial time. That's right. So I think this, in what you showed us today, implies that it is not complete for polynomial time under first order or even F. That's absolutely right. No, no, well, no, no. It follows from, it follows from this because, because fixed point with counting is not all of polynomial time. If linear programming was complete under first order reductions, everything in polynomial time would be in fixed point with counting, which we know is false. So, so, so yes, it follows. Unlike, say, Hamiltonicity, which we know by is it, is it, complete under For and be complete under first order reductions. Yes, that's right. But of course, we don't know any P complete problems under first order reductions because if there were, we would have a logic for P. But. Yes, yes. Exactly, exactly. So, but, but, but this is proof, but this is proof that linear programming, linear programming is, is not such, yes. Uh, uh, please help me understand the corollary here. Yeah. Uh, so, because CSP is not of bounded width, mm -hmm. uh, we know but, uh, by the top of me that, uh, that CSP, max CSP is empty hat, right? That's right. So, what does this, but this, this uh, relaxation? Yeah, so, 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 so the idea is this. You um, actually maybe let me go back here. Oh, it's, it's a big, it's a big semi-definite program. That's right. It's an exponent. Ah. Uh, as the the, the semi-definite programs are exponential in the, the level, so the tth level is of size exponential in t. But right? doesn't this relate to the question of Albert about the uniformity? Well, in, in fact, prob probably yes, because the, because the tth level is of size n to the t, you need linear and t variables to, to express, uh, to construct it. So, so it's not the answer. Yeah, yeah uh, good point, All yes. Right. Well, mm -hmm. OK. Another, uh, the last question, if I may. So uh, we know that max CSP gamma mm -hmm. is in the class max SMP because of Papa Dimitri and Yanakakis. It's about okay. the approximate, constant approximate programs. So, uh, right. so the, this is another big success of this field of complexity, right? Mm -hmm. The way mm -hmm. we find uh, yeah. some optimization problems tells us something about the approximability of the problems. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, uh, for the last 20 years, people have worked very hard to determine the threshold of approximability. Yeah. Does uh, information about this uh, counting width tell us something about the threshold? Do you I, I, I don't really know, because in fact, you know, I mean, even in the context of Lasser hierarchy, people have often looked at these as giving approximate solutions. And, but the criterion we were using here is the rather stronger one. At what level do you get exactly 
the convex hull of the integer solutions, which is not quite the same thing. And so, the um, that people like uh, Rakas Ragavedan have done is to determine the thresholds modulo the unique games conjecture, right? Right, 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 right. It would be nice to see if we can bring here. Okay, yeah, I, I'll just have to say I don't know to that. Yeah. Or, or relating to that, maybe within the context of this FVC framework, mm -hmm. uh, essentially giving an analog of a, an answer to the unique games conjecture in that context, in the yes. sense that, you know, you know, they, they want to show that that is NP-hard, yeah. but here, okay, you have a surrogate for that, mm -hmm. showing that it's not F FPC. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know. yeah, 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 yeah. No, that's, a, that's a very outstanding open problem, whether the Lasser hierarchy refutes the unique games projector. Oh. So but, the, the Lasser hierarchy is, right, is a candidate uh, refuting our what, what does it mean? the hierarchy to refuse the context. That maybe five levels of the hierarchy gives you an end to the five algorithm to refute the unique games context. Uh, oh, oh, I see. So you're saying that, the, can you go to that last slide? Sorry, the, the, so you're saying that- The last one. Then says the connection between the, the SER hierarchy and this now says, refuting it in the context of FBC. No, we, we, no, no so, so this connection is specifically to, for, for things of the format CSP. It's for exact. Uh, it's for exact. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So there is still a possibility of doing what I said, which is in, in within this FBC framework, saying that you know you can't <laughs> resolve the unique games conjecture in polynomial time, and that kind of acting as a surrogate for um, you know what. Well, I need to think. Yeah. Can't touch. Okay. I think. Yeah. We need to take a break now. Thank you.